Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And let's go to the Lord in prayer for our time in Bible study. Father, we thank you this morning uh, for the clarity that you bring to our hearts pertaining to even political issues. Lord, we know that whenever the word has been given and wherever it has gone, it has always been alive in the midst of the culture in which it lives. And so, Lord, we pray that this word today would resonate in every heart in the midst of this culture as it was intended to resonate in the midst of the culture in which it was written and to which it was written. And so, Father, we pray that each of us today would find something in this word of great value to, to us, to each one of us, uh, as your Holy Spirit would seek to minister to every heart in this room today. And, and even those watching online, Lord, we pray for them as well. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just a, a refresher, since it's been a couple weeks since we were here in the book of Hebrews. These are Jewish believers being addressed in the book of Hebrews, thus the title. Uh, Jews that have come to a saving faith, a born-again faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the difficulties these Jewish believers were facing were causing some of them to consider going back, evidently. And, and there have been references to that by the author of the book, possibly even renouncing their born-again faith in Christ, which would have been tragic. And the reason that we say that it's tragic is not because of what they may experience in this life, but it is eternally tragic. To renounce your faith in Jesus Christ is eternally tragic. And instead, the author who I've shared with you, I think it's Paul, instead the author encourages them to consider their own history which is always, always, always required an enduring faith. And the best way to see your future is to look to your past, isn't it? And that's why knowing your history is so very important. And in the histories of the world, the, the cultures of the world, the anthropologies of the world, the governments of the world, as we look back to history as being such an important indicator of where we're headed, we understand that throughout the course of history, and it's been fairly recent history in this regard, Marxists and socialists always deny their history. And one of the reasons that I say that they deny their history is because there's never been a successful Marxist government anywhere in human history. There has never been a successful socialist government anywhere in human history. Oh, it's been tried. It's been tried many times over, and we can look to the world uh, for examples of those two forms of governing, and everywhere we see those two forms of governing, if we study the history of those two forms of governing, we'll find that they always fail. They always fail. They are contrary to human interest. They are contrary to what any individual human being may flourish under. On the other hand, fascists and tyrants, they invent history, don't they? So Marxists and socialists, they deny history. Don't look back there. Always look ahead. There's nothing, there's nothing to see there in the USSR. There's nothing to see there under Mao Zedong. There's nothing to see there under Cuba. There's nothing to see there under World War II Italy. There's nothing to see there in the abominable economic structure of all the socialist governments in the world even today that spend far more than they ever could conceive of taking in. And then fascists and tyrants, well, well they just invent history. They invent history out of whole cloth. And they go back and, and they look at history that has proven to be reliable down through the centuries and they change it. They change the focus of it. They, they reinvent what was taking place then, or they take the modern cultural, what's going on in the modern cultural day in which we live, and, and they apply those same cultural standards to back then, when, and they invent a way of doing better than has ever been done before. On the other hand, Judeo-Christians study history and report history. In fact, if, if you were to examine it, you would find that the history that we have, culturally speaking, has always been 
primarily recorded by someone of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And because they are of the Judeo-Christian ethic, they have reported history as faithfully as God would have them do. And so it is a reliable history upon which we stand. Now, these particular Jewish Christians, Christians of a Jewish background, what we would call a completed Jew, they've already been through so much. Uh, these were not wimpy believers. Oh, no. Uh, they've been through far more than we've ever experienced. Th these were very difficult times. All we need to do is, is remember what we read last week in chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. If your Bible's like mine, all you have to do is look on the same page over at, at verse 32 where we read, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. And we know that, that people of the Jewish faith who came to Christ, they were ostracized, they were put out, they were excommunicated from the temple, they were not allowed to participate in synagogue services. Their families rejected them, they were written off as, as being dead. There were, there were no further associations with those relationships that they had previously had. They could not find employment. They could not buy or sell in the markets. They had to sort of cloister among themselves, and it explains why in the early days of the church they, they came up with a, a, sense, a system of, of communism, not, not communism, but communism, where those who were wealthy could share with those who were poor that they would have enough to eat and, and even to survive. And then even Paul who I believe is the author of, of this letter to the Hebrew believers, he was a part of that persecution of the first day's church. And, and in his own words, he murdered and imprisoned Jews who, who came to Christ simply because they had come to Christ. That was the structure of the society in, in which they live. This was not an easy time to be a believer. Oh, no. And, and if you think that they're indicating a sort of fractured faith because of looking back or because of some of them even turning back under that sort of cultural pressure. Uh, we've never experienced anything like that, and we have no idea what they were enduring, but we can appreciate what, again, I think Paul wrote, but recall the former days in which after you, illuminate, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. You've already been through so much, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. And it's one thing to be persecuted yourself, but it's almost as painful to look upon someone else being persecuted or tortured or killed as we look upon the Afghan Christians in this day or the missionaries that are trapped behind the lines of the Taliban who are being tortured and murdered and, and brutally killed in, in ways that we can't even imagine, especially in, in the, quote, modern age that such barbaric um, behavior is still being practiced in our day. And, and it breaks our hearts to see that happening. And we, you know, are in prayer for those knowing that the only wet part of what disturbs us the most is, is it appears as that there's nothing that we can do about it, you know? This, this has been so poorly handled that, that people are just caught up in this tragedy and we're left with, of course, the greatest power of all, which is to pray. And we're encouraged to pray for those in the same way that these believers, I'm sure, prayed for their fellow believers in their day. Paul even makes reference to himself, I think, in verse 34 of chapter 10, for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. And all of this is setting the stage for what is described in chapter 11. And we understand that to possess an enduring faith and we look to history to provide the basis for that, to, to see that there is such a thing as an enduring faith, which is very important. To possess an enduring faith, it is necessary to understand exactly what faith is. And we read it in, in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, 
For by it, the elders, or those who have preceded us in faith, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Um, that phrase, they obtained a good testimony, the Greek word martyrio, sounds very familiar to our ears. Martyr, um, testimony, that they have, that their lives speak out across the pages of history. The substance of things hoped for, spelled out in verse 1. Hupostasis is the Greek word for substance. And we get a clue from the use of even the English language. It is the substance. It is the, the stage upon which I stand is the substance. It's underneath. It bolsters my, it holds up my weight. It holds up my body. And so when we think about the substance, we're talking about the foundation. It is the substance of things hoped for. And what is the substance of everything that we hope for, would you say? It's God's word, isn't it? It's God's word, and of course, God's word declares to each one of us what God's will is for our life. And the most important thing about faith, and everyone has faith, everyone. Everyone lives their life by faith in something or other, The most important thing about faith is the object of your faith. And the object of your faith being truth in the course, in the case of of God's word and God's will for your life. Secondarily, the evidence, uh, the elankos in the Greek, the proof, the conviction, the evidence of things not seen, not seen. And, And so we have this example of the evidence of things not seen In this case, God's history with his people. We haven't seen that, but we've heard about it. And that's what we see there in verse 2. The elders obtained a good testimony. That their lives, the fact that they endured in their faith, speaks out loudly across the pages of history that we can also endure in our faith despite whatever persecution or punishment we may receive for our faith or ridicule if if that would be the case in your life. And the difficulties endured by the faith in God's word demonstrated by those who have preceded us tells us we can likewise endure. And we must. There's no, there's no option. There is no option. After all, we've placed our faith in a creator God. We've placed our faith in the creator God, which he speaks of in verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. It is the most rational, logical line of thought to put your faith in Creator God. The Lord desires and always appeals to our capacity for reasoning. In Isaiah chapter 1, very famously, Most of you probably know where I'm going with this. In Isaiah chapter 1, we have this declaration by God because some people think that when they come to Christ or when they're encouraged to place their faith in God that they are somehow practicing blind faith and nothing could be further from the truth. That as we have just read, it is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. It is not blind. It is a seeing faith. And it is a seeing faith based upon rational thought and observation. God always appeals to our reasoning, as we see here in in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. 
for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So let's huddle together with God and let's reason these things out. And God promises that if you walk with him, it will be well with you, not only in this life, but particularly in the next. That does not mean that you will avoid trouble. It means that God will walk with you through the trouble. However, if you, just, if you decide not to place your faith in creator God, the one who has made you, the one who has made the universe, the one who has made everything that we see and touch and taste and feel and hear, the creator of, of all of that, if, if you choose to turn to whatever options there may be available to you, and the enemy always makes sure that there are many, many options, chief among them being religious practice. If you choose to turn to those things instead of relationship with the true and living God, your, your, your creator God, the one who has made you, the one who loves you so very much that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die to pay the price for your sins, if you turn away from that, if you reject him, then it will not be well with you. And you may have great wealth, you may have great riches, but you will live with an abiding emptiness, and some of you have already discovered that. In fact, I would caution to say all of you have already experienced that. All of you have experienced walking apart from the Lord and the, the deep sense of loneliness and emptiness and pain that is constant in your heart. And the reason is because God has made you for himself and there will always be an emptiness there until you relent, until you repent, until you come and offer yourself to be in relationship with God. We say this all the time, the Bible is not a book of science. But when it makes a scientific statement, it's always true. And there are found throughout the pages of God's word many, many scientific statements. And they're amazing when you think about them. But we see one right here in verse 3. All things are made of things which are not visible. Of course, that seems um, undeniably apparent to us because in our lives, we went to science class. And some of us even had to take chemistry. Some of us even advanced far enough to delve into physics and that sort of thing. But I can tell you, for thousands of years, that was not apparent. And how interesting it is that in the realm of faith, when we're talking about the context in which faith is practiced, that one of those great areas of faith is in the fact that everything is made of things that can't be seen. And I don't know when that came along, but I do know that the, the atom was discovered in 1896. So almost 2,000 years after this word was written, this didn't have to be updated, did it? And no scientific statement contained in the Bible has ever had to be updated. Now, the science book that I studied in high school that we were just referring to has had to be updated many, many times because men don't know what's going on. Men can only observe what they think they see. And one of the things that men have discovered is that all things are made of things which are not visible. Really? How can you prove that? Well, we do know about atoms now. In the 20th century, men began to discover atoms. And then they began to discover that atoms were comprised of a particle, particles. It's interesting when you think about the nature of discovery. In, in 1906, there was a, a gentleman who discovered and won the Nobel Peace Prize for the discovery or for proving that an electron, which is one of the particles of an atom, is a particle. And then in 1937, this man's son also won the Nobel Peace Prize for proving that an electron was a beam. And both are true. An electron is a particle, and an electron is a beam. How could that be? Further evidence has proven to us that <laughs> when you look at an atom, the supposed building blocks, although now they're discovering there are things smaller than, than atoms, but if we were just to talk about atoms and atomic research, now we are getting into um, the study uh, of the nature of how those things exist and how they are comprised. You know, when you heat oxygen, 
in a fire, it burns red at a particular temperature, it burns white at an even higher temperature, and then it burns blue at an even higher temperature than that. And the reason is because the electrons are being excited and they emit a different color of light at different heat levels. And that's really what caused them to look into the discovery of these uh, particulate matters that we are seeing in, in what is referred to as, as quantum physics or even more mysterious quantum mechanics, how it is that these things operate and, and interrelate at, at the atomic level. You know, some, things, some people are concerned about the idea of, of cremation uh, versus burial. And one of the things that we know is that you are a soul. You know, I, I'm presently standing before you as, as a soul that has a body. And when this body passes away and, and becomes, you know, goes back to the dust, um, some people are concerned about, well, what happens to, how can this, this body be, how can I be recapitulated, how can I be resurrected in bodily form if my body's been burned? But we understand from the nature of, of atomic particulate study or quantum mechanics that it, it really doesn't, you know, God can indiscriminately grab any old set of atoms and create a body for you it's your soul that matters. It's, it's like the difference between hardware and software. Software is invisible, but it is, it is the code that is really you, if we were thinking about it in terms of a computer. And given the nature of atoms, God can, can make you, your, God can make a body for you that would be you out of any atoms that exist in any particular time. Because atoms, the, the building blocks are not specific to the nature of who you are only fashioned by God into who you are. It's, it's amazing that if, if the nucleus of an atom was the size of a basketball, and I was holding it up for you now, the electron in a hydrogen atom, the electron in a hydrogen atom would be rotating around that nucleus the distance from here to Los Angeles, California. This is the mind-blowing stuff that physicists who got into quantum mechanics found. And it's been stated by many of them, brilliant men nonetheless, that if you're not just amazed and flabbergasted by what you see when it comes to quantum mechanics, then you haven't seen quantum mechanics. Because what, they're, what they find and what they continue to find is absolutely preposterous pertaining to, you know, this being a solid. How could this be a solid with that much space? And they discovered that if you took all the space out of all the atoms that exist on the Earth itself, and the Earth itself is uh, 8,000 miles in diameter, and, and we can sort of understand the mass of, of everything that, that is the earth and everything that exists upon the earth, and if you took all the space out of all the atoms that comprise everything that pertains to the earth, the earth itself could fit in a basket. That's how much space there is. And what quantum mechanics, what quantum physicists have discovered is that solid is a is a something we don't understand. They've also discovered, and, and get this, that the only time that you can, and this is a little bit mind-blowing, but the only time that you can actually observe the particulate behavior of the atomic structures when it pertains to quantum mechanics is when you actually look at it. That before you observe it, it's as if it's not there. They have discovered that. And I hope your mind is as blown by my mind. You know, Einstein, in his special theory of relativity, stated that he could not imagine anything going faster than the speed of light. And a lot of his postulations and theories were based on that. <laughs> what they discovered when they began to develop the means by way of quantum mechanics 
to sort of manipulate the particulate matter that atoms are comprised of. Well, they discovered that if they deflected an electron away from the nucleus of an atom, I'm going to try to say this slow so that it's understandable. When they deflected one of these electrons that orbit around the, the uh, nucleus of an atom, when they deflected it in one direction, well, it would travel at the speed of light. But they also observed at the same time that it traveled away at the speed of light, that another electron also traveled away at the speed of light. Now, if you remember the word problems in math in elementary school, Anybody like word problems? Do you remember the relative speed if you have a car going in one direction at 50 miles an hour and another car going in the other direction at 50 miles an hour? What is the relative speed? And that you add the relative speed together and you get cars that are actually going 100 miles an hour separating from themselves. Anybody remember that problem? That was an easy one, wasn't it? Well, what do you get if you have an, an electron traveling this way at the speed of light, and you have an electron traveling this way at the speed of light. Whew. That blew Einstein's mind, and he gave up on that point. Because now we're observing something, relative speed traveling twice as fast as the speed of light, and get this, they, they developed a means by deflecting that, that initial uh, electron that they had peeled away that was now moving at the speed of light. They developed a way to deflect that, that electron with a plate, and the electron that was heading in the other direction also was deflected, also mirror imaged that electron that was deflected by a plate, even though it was not deflected by a plate. One renowned scientist came to the conclusion that only the Bible makes mention of more than three dimensions. Only the Bible is up to date when it comes to the contemporary findings of what has been observed so far uh, pertaining to quantum mechanics. And it is a, a fascinating, mind-blowing study to be involved in, and it is constantly blowing the minds of the physicists that are looking into quantum mechanics, and, and they've since developed some other theories, some people proposing, pertaining to string theory, which I can't begin to, to really understand, but I know of the existence of it, maybe some of you do as well, that there may be as many as 10 dimensions. But then we remember that, that faith when we say that all things are made of things which are not visible, faith is equal to the substance based upon evidence. And we have all this evidence pertaining to the creation itself. And it is creator God who has made these things. They have not evolved. And God is transcendent. And what that means is that God exists outside of time and space and matter. And when it pertains to time, one of the reasons that we call time a dimension is because it has been demonstrated by these same physicists that time is affected by gravity. And, you know, pertaining to... Einstein's theory of relativity, that has been demonstrated that an atomic clock, which are absolutely accurate at the top of a mountain, moves at a slightly measurably different speed than an, than an atomic clock at sea level. And some of you know that because I've said that before. So that means that phew, time is affected by gravity. So that means... Phew, Anything that's affected by gravity has mass. Time has mass. Can't see it. Do you believe it? Do you believe that's true? It's been demonstrated that it's true. God is transcendent. And as this atomic physicist noted about the Bible, 
Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, um, Paul makes reference of this in speaking of at least four dimensions when he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Did you catch that? Width and length and depth and height. Paul is already on to something that scientists have had yet to discover. And that's the way the Bible is. When the Bible makes a scientific statement, because it is the Word of God, because it has been written by God Himself in the person of the Holy Spirit, it is always accurate, whether it's history, whether it's anthropo anthropology, whether it's geology, or whether it's atomic structure, or whether it's the fact that the life is in the blood, as we've previously studied in the book of Hebrews, or whether there are more than three dimensions. And when, you know, you get to the end of chapter 11 and you begin to peek into chapter 12 and verse 1, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That with so much space <laughs> present in the matter that we perceive to be solid, which we know is not solid at all, there's plenty of space for more dimensions. And when it says that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it is referring to the very witnesses that we are about to discover as examples in this great chapter of faith. And these witnesses testify to us profoundly, loudly, that great difficulties can be endured by trust in God's will. And trust in God's will for your life equals faith. It is when we forget or deny our history with God that we begin to falter. And so herein, the author, who again I believe is Paul, employs 17 examples of those who endured great difficulties, trials, tragedies by their faith in God's will for their lives. And if you want to know God's will for your life, which seems to be the, maybe the preeminent question that believers who have trusted by faith in Jesus Christ have for themselves, you know, what is God's will for my life? You want to know God's will for your life? Here's the answer. We read here, it is for you to have an enduring faith, an enduring faith in the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ and in an abiding personal relationship with him. That's, that's God's will for your life. And everything will proceed from that. And, and nothing can happen apart from that. It is of primary importance. And so we read of Abel, and we read of Abel's faith in verse 4 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And now we're, we're, we're getting some commentary here in, in Hebrews chapter 11 about things that have happened historically among those who were the foundation of the Jewish faith. Obviously, Abel and Cain greatly preceded the existence of the Jewish faith by at least a thousand years. And yet we see their faith being practiced toward God. They had obviously been taught about blood sacrifice being the requirement for coming into or um, making an offering, a sacrificial offering before God. And, and Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice in that regard. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 4, the first 15 verses of Genesis chapter 4. And through that, he obtained a witness, that, that self-same witness that is referred to in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11. It became his testimony that he offered this excellent sacrifice, that he was righteous, and God testified, God testified to Cain that Abel's sacrifice was more righteous than him. Now, evidently, they had both been taught about blood sacrifice, and Cain was trying a different method. But God has a way in which we are to approach him. 
And that is very important for us to understand. And we may die for holding on to that or, or placing all of our faith in that method. And that's exactly what happened in Abel's life. His brother Cain put him to death. Cain had his own methodology, if you will, of how it is that he would approach God, how he would choose to approach God, but it was not according to God's command. It was not according to God's desire. And God reasoned with Cain. He did not treat him harshly. It was Cain who responded with evil. God tried to, to bring Cain along in, in a very gentle way, but Cain killed his brother because he saw his brother as being preferred by God. And God said, you know, the, your brother's blood cries out to me. Your sin cries out to me from the ground. And that's always the way that it is with sin. But this is, this is first and foremost an example of those who are faithful to approaching God according to his design for how it is that we must approach him. In our time, it is that we must approach him by placing our faith in Jesus Christ and being born again. And that may cost us our life. There are people today in Afghanistan that stance in faith, placing their faith in Jesus Christ in order to be in relationship with God will cost them their life. That is undeniable. By faith, Enoch was taken away, verse 5, so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for he was taken, or excuse me, for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Again, referring to the testimony of those who have preceded us in death, verse 2, talking about the elders obtaining a good testimony here that is spoken of again. It was the testimony of God that, that Enoch walked with God for 300 years. And then after Methuselah was born, God took him. And Enoch becomes a type of those who are in such relationship with God, walking with God, that he becomes a type of the rapture. He becomes a type of being removed from the tribulation that is about to befall the world that we saw take place in Noah's time. Now, look what it says there that he was taken. Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so I want to set this next verse in context because this next verse is very important to our existence with God, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so you have to put that together. Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Four, and here's the nature of what our faith must be. He's telling us what we are to believe. And he says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. There's so many people in the world today denying the existence of God, denying the, the creation of God, putting their faith and hope in something that's, that's called evolution or evolutionary science that has proven over and over again to be absolutely preposterous on its face. And even many um, scientists who have placed their faith in evolutionary um, discovery have turned back. They've discovered that it's a dead end. They've, they've discovered that it cannot be supported by scientific observation. But... For those who believe that God is and, so we believe that God is, that he exists, and we also believe that there is an eternal reward for those who believe that he is. For those who believe that he is to such an extent that they've placed their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. That's what that's saying. And when you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, then you are rewarded with eternal life in the kingdom of heaven that you do not deserve that Christ has paid the price for. And that's your reward. And this is how we are pleasing to God. But it's also how those who refuse to place their faith in Jesus Christ, in the case of, of Jewish believers who would consider turning back to the practices and the rituals of, of Jew, Judaism, that they, they turn away from Christ. And as we read in chapter 10, the, the apostasy that that could arise in their lives where they actually trample, trample on the body of Jesus Christ and they consider his sacrifice to be nothing more than, than just any man being killed. That's a very dangerous place to be and, and the, the, there is that incredible warning in chapter 10 and you can go back and hear that warning if you weren't here the last time that we were together. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Now, what would cause me to diligently seek the Lord? Well, I look out on your faces, and it, it's very pleasing to me that you're diligently seeking the Lord by being here today, but it's also pleasing to God, and God sees that you're diligently seeking the Lord here today. You, you've searched till, till you found a place that teaches God's word, and God is, is desiring that you would know his word, and, and he loves those who are diligent enough to, to faithfully seek him out where he may be found. And that can take place in a one-on-one -on -one basis, but he encourages us, as we read the last time we were together, that, that we assemble ourselves together, that we, that we fit and function, that part of our faith is, is fitting and functioning together, thinking about the, what that mean, what that word assembling means. It, it doesn't mean simply to gather, it means to fit together. Giving the example of the thousand piece puzzle. You can have a, a heap of puzzle pieces and that's a gathering, but when you begin to assemble that puzzle and put it together, then you get a picture. And then you understand what this puzzle is all about. So if your Christian walk is just to be part of a heap of, of people that come together without any particular form or function, then you haven't arrived yet. And, and it's time to, to step forward and it's time to find out where you fit in and function, whether it's in this church or whether it's in another church that God might call you to. And, and that's very important to understand. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, that being rainfall, it had never rained, that the earth had been watered by a, a water canopy, a very heavy dew, which we understand that in South Florida, don't we? Um, probably to an even greater degree. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to him. And Noah, obviously, if, if Enoch is a type of those who are raptured out of, uh, raptured prior to the tribulation, just prior to it, in Enoch's case, then Noah becomes a type of those Jews who are preserved through the tribulation by faith. And you can read that story in Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapters 8 and 9, and, and you'll see an amazing story, an amazing study of, of, of building this ark, constructing this ark that was 450 feet long. And some of you have been to the, the ark experience there in uh, northern Kentucky and, and have an idea about the, the scale and the scope of that ark. And he brought his family with him. And they preserved the lineage of the uh, the animals and, and the, the biology that, that we are aware of and, and the botany that we are aware of and, and then the humankind um, coming forth through them. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. You ever been called to just go somewhere by God? Abraham is the, the first example of that. And we read about that in the first nine verses of Genesis Chapter 12, hopefully you're familiar with the story. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he, walked, he waited, excuse me, for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Somehow, some way, God communicated to him the evidence, the substance of the kingdom of heaven. And, and this is the direction in which he walked, leaving everything behind in order to travel that road that God commanded that he would travel upon. By faith, Sarah, who was his wife, herself also received strength to conceive seed, and, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And when you get into the story of Abraham and Sarah, one of the things that just stands out, if you know the stories, if you've read the stories, is that they weren't entirely faithful, were they? When Abraham was called to go out to the promised land, he was told to leave his family behind. Instead, he brought his whole family with him, and he only went halfway. And then his father died, which gave him the idea of, well, now I'll go ahead and proceed to the, pro to the promised land. And, and then he brought his nephew Lot with him. So in each case, he, he was disobeying God. Did Sarah, was Sarah 
eminently faithful to what God had promised to, to provide for them, a child that, that God had given Abraham the promise, and then Sarah had overheard that promise when, when they were visited by, by the angels, and they were promised that about this time next year you shall conceive and, and bear a son. And she laughed, at, at that was so preposterous. Well, note for yourself how graceful God is, thinking about your own life. When we read chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews, only acts of faith are recorded. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> and, and I say that to say this, that God looks at your life. And in every way that he can reward you for faith, he does. He keeps track of your faith. And everything that is not done of faith is just wiped away. And so when your life, when the, the books are open for, uh, as, as we read about the, the Bema Seat judgment where Jesus judges his people, his church for reward, it will be those acts of faith that will be noted there in the, in the exact same way that they are noted here. And, and you can read Sarah's story in Genesis chapter 18 verses 1 through 7. And pertaining to Abraham and Sarah, the promise had been made to Abraham, who, when he was 90 years old, after all, I mean, he went out from the land of, of his, his home um, at, at the age of 75. And so he was on this journey, and his father died, and then he comes into the promised land with his nephew Lot. And, and, and God promises Abram that from him, from his seed shall come descendants as numerous as the sand on the sea and as numerous as the stars in the sky. And therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude innumerable as the sand which is on the seashore. We read about those two promises of God to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, and in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. And God fulfilled those promises, didn't he? And, and it was amazing how he did this. Now, these all, every one of these people that we've read, these great pillars of faith, these great examples historically being brought forward as those who endured in their faith, they all died in faith. They all died in faith. Their faith endured to the end. And that's what's important. Their faith endured to the end, not having seen what we've seen. Because we've seen a lot more than they saw. And that's the point. That's part of the point that's being made here as, as we continue to read in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. See, they were looking forward to the promise of the Messiah who is to come. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And this is the longing in the soul of every believer, that we seek a better place, that we seek a place where only righteousness is found, a place where there's no more death, where there's no more dying, where there's no more pain, where there's no more suffering. And that is only found in God's kingdom. And, and we long for that, um, to, to be brought back into that, that perfect relationship with God. And so the exemplification of our faith in that, in that kingdom that our eyes do not see is evidence in the testimony of our lives and how faithful we are to God's plan for our lives and he goes on to say, you know, don't look back. This is, this is always the danger that if everyone is in the room here today is born again, there, there exists the possibility, there exists the potential. Otherwise, these warnings would not be present. Don't look back. Don't look back to the way things used to be. Because whenever you look back to the way things used to be, you're being tempted by Satan that he would draw you in. And he would have you remember the good times and forget about the commode-hugging times. And he would have you remember the, the laughs without having you remember the misery. There's something about the human condition that he can prey upon. 
or he would have you remember the religious traditions and the robes and the cathedrals and, and the great towering hymns and the reverence apart from the teaching of God's word, but with all that stuff, with all that regalia. And he would seek to draw you back in because all you have on this side is an invisible God and the word of God to stand upon as the foundation of your life. And there is a danger. Truly, if they called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. You've always got the opportunity to return. You still have free will. It's still your choice to abide in Christ presently, every day. When you wake up, when you go to bed at night, will you continue to abide in Christ? But now, these examples, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Second Peter put it this way. In Second Peter chapter 1, Peter writing, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And here we're talking about the testimony of faith. That he's, he's telling us what he's literally seen and touched and handled with his hands. For he received Jesus from God the Father, honor and glory, when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, speaking of the Mount of Transfiguration. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have, we have, we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, one of the things that Amir was alluding to last Sunday when he was here, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And of course, Jesus, in referring to this promise, said this in John's Gospel, chapter 14, one of the most heartwarming statements ever known to mankind let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me it's a choice that we make and also the emphasis there is in continuing to believe in continuing to believe in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i, I would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And of course, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can, you, how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. People do not come to the Father through religion, religious practice. People do not come to the Father through their own expression of their own righteousness or whatever it may be. You may have a great following. You may have everything that the world perceives as being you know, righteous or whatever it is, but no one comes to the Father apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. These great testimonies of enduring faith, uh, we can continue to, to read ahead about these testimonies, but the fact that these died looking ahead should speak to us quite loudly about the fact that we die looking back to the prophetic word made alive in the person of Jesus Christ and in his ministry. You see, their great testimonies of enduring faith, which we see and, and we literally hear these things with our ears here, their enduring faith, which ultimately was in the promised Messiah, the long-promised 
Messiah, whom they looked forward to, they had to wait patiently for the salvation. Think about that. It was only when Jesus came that they were rescued in the way that we are likewise rescued. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday when we continue our study together in Hebrews chapter 11. They had to wait patiently for the salvation that we may receive immediately. And it's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, at verse 1, we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, quoting from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. And this is why Paul writes in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, behold, now, we don't have to wait. You can be saved right here, right now. Behold, now it's possible. The potential exists. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And one of the things that we clearly, plainly understand by faith in God's word is that there is only one means of salvation. Jesus said it himself to a very religious man, you must be born again. That is the only, only, only means of salvation. That's what Jesus meant when he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if anything, studying the examples that we see here on the pages of Hebrews chapter 11, this great chapter also known of as, as the hall of faith, if anything, our faith in Christ should be stronger than theirs was. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the, the clear pronouncements that we see in your word pertaining to what it means to have believing faith and what it means to have believing faith that endures no matter what comes against it or no matter in what fire it stands. Lord, in fact, what we see, what we have read in the pages of the history of what your word declares is that, that that fire of the world, the persecution, the troubles, the struggles, purify our faith. And it is the intensity with which that, that flame burns which makes us purer and, and purer. But Lord, we know that placing our faith in, in the discovery that we find here in your word is that part's incumbent upon us. You give us the substance upon which we may stand. And you give us all the evidence that we could ever need or want or desire uh, to prove that these things are so. And then you leave it to ourselves to make that decision of whether to place our faith in you or whether to go on about placing our faith in worldly ways and unrighteousness says and, and the emptiness and the struggle that's found in this earth or, or even the brilliance of, of scientific minds or whatever it may be. Lord, how grateful we are that you've shown us a way that is not only appealing to our conscience and its perfection, but is empowered by both your love and your spirit in that holy direction. And, and, and that's really the appeal as we continue in an attitude of prayer that, that I believe that God is making here today is there's a direction that he has for your life that he's established. And whether you are in that direction or not is completely dependent upon a decision that you would make at some point in your life. And given the nature of what Paul has stated, knowing that Christ has already died to pay the price for your sins, Christ has already been buried for three days as the prophecies declared, Christ has already been raised from the dead as the prophecies likewise declared, 
Christ has already ascended to heaven and where he sits at the right hand of God the Father as the prophecies had declared. All of that has already taken place. We are not looking forward to it. We're looking back to a great cloud of witnesses who have declared these things to be true. And they have reported to us down through the centuries what Jesus himself said, you must be born again. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we're going to play a song of invitation, and the invitation is this. Will you walk with Jesus today? That's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And if you will walk with Jesus, the Holy Spirit will be made alive in your heart, and you will be born again. And you will return to that Edenic construction of which mankind was originally built. You had God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, a three-in-one God. Man was initially created as spirit, soul, and body, a three-in-one construct. Made in the image of God in that way. Then the spirit died when man fell. But you can return to that spirit-filled relationship with God by placing your faith in exactly that. And as we play the song of invitation, as the Holy Spirit would minister to you today, about that very needful thing in your life, I would encourage you to rise from your seat and come to the front and we will pray with you what we call affectionately the, the prayer of salvation. Now, it won't be the prayer that saves you, it will be the desire of your heart that saves you and God sees the desire of your heart. And then we'll pray for you as the body of Christ that you would be strengthened and enabled in your, in your first day's walk with Christ as the Lord of your life.